Thank you for that song. Tremendous truth in that. And well delivered. Well, I'm glad you're here tonight. If you need a handout, if you'd raise your hand back there, how to top 10 ways to ruin your children. If you think someone else around you needs a handout, raise your hand for them. If you think your spouse needs a handout, stand up and point to them. And that'll be just great. You'll be outside. And... <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I'm glad you're here. As we begin this new series, understand a couple things about this series. There's some young people up here who are desperately want to raise your children the right way. I appreciate that. And uh, understand a couple things that I did not write this series uh, pointed toward any one person. Right? So it's not towards you. If, if you think this is about you, um, it is, but not on purpose. Uh, my wife could not make it tonight with her knee surgery. It is for her, though. This is for Doreen. So, Doreen, this is for you. You're watching right now, and I will pay for that later on. I deny it, but I'm live, so it doesn't matter. I can't get out of it. Parenting is not for the faint of heart now, is it? Not for the faint of heart. I realize that we have a wide, uh, a wide array of people in this room. We have those who are past the parenting stage. We have those way before the parenting stage. And we have those right in the middle of the parenting stage. And I believe that the Lord would have us look at some of these truths will be a help to us, I believe. And uh, I, they, have said, they have said that Christianity is one generation away from extinction. If we're going to have a good, strong church in the future and a good, strong uh, testimony for God and for His kingdom then we're going to have to, parents, we're going to have to raise our children uh, with God's help, right, the best way that we can, with his grace and with his strength. I think there's still some over here who need one, Brother Joe. Joe, you're doing great, man. Thank you for helping out with those, those handouts. And um, it's not for the faint of heart. In fact, I would, I would submit that kids are not getting any better. Kids are not getting any better, and I would like to blame the kids, but the reality is we ought to blame the parents. We've all been there at the Walmart where we've noticed a child who is out of control. Out of control. On the ground, kicking, screaming, all for a candy bar. You hear the parents' responses. Be quiet. Stop it. I'm going to pinch you. If I buy you this, will you stop now? Before long, what happens? Parent relents, don't they? They buy the candy bar, easier to stop the madness. The child sits there with a smug look on their face. How many have observed this before? And how many have that urge, like from, the, from your toes, all the way up to just want to, to just take care of the situation? <laughs> to just give a little bit of advice and help to this young little devil. <laughs> right? To just carefully explain quietly and calmly how that's not a good way to behave and carefully open God's word and knocked him halfway across the store you felt that come on you felt that you felt that I for many years with my wife we took pictures one of uh, my favorite experiences not to take pictures was to was to experience family pictures I discovered early on that family pictures went through three stages before you were done all right with children stage number one parents would threaten children you sit there smile look up stop touching your sister turn around don't mess with your clothes sit there behind my camera and start to smirk but we weren't done taking pictures yet stage two follows stage number one Stage two is bribery. Always, always bribery happens after threatening. If you sit still, we'll go to McDonald's. Hey, listen, do you want some gummy bears? Oh, mommy made mac and cheese. We're going to get some after this. At this point, we were closer to the end of family pictures, but we were still not done. Stage three, my favorite stage. At stage three, now I knew we were about 30 seconds to a minute from being done, Stage three was when the parents would threaten about the bribery. If you don't sit still, we're not going to McDonald's. At that point, there's nothing left. We're about done right now. We're wrapped up. Parenting. 
The Bible on your paper there gives us some instruction. I've entitled this series, The Top Ten Ways to Ruin Your Kids. I'll do my best to not spend too much time on every one. I have two for tonight and probably two to three each week and take maybe four to five weeks and, and wrap this up. I'll try to keep myself under control in here. Now, I don't present myself for a moment as a perfect parent. All right, I am not. And you can sit there easily and say, well, you know what? You say that, but I know you and I know your kids. You'd be exactly right. Exactly right. I don't stand before you as an expert, right, either. But I do stand before you with some truths from the Word of God. Just as far as references go, I, had, I did spend four years as youth pastor and 12 years as a school principal. I have probably worked with more kids than most of you have and more parents. I have observed a lot of situations. Again, I'm not an expert, would not profess or claim to be one. I can identify good behavior. I've observed it. I can identify terrible behavior. I've observed it. I've watched kids respond to parents positively and negatively. I've had kids respond to me, my own, and those who are not my own, positively and negatively. I have been there as parents have begun to scream at their children, and I have watched children scream at their parents. Both incredibly awkward situations, awkward times. I've been screamed at as well, but it doesn't matter. At, by parents because of their children, but different story, different time, different series. Hang around long enough, I'm sure I'll share those stories one day when I'm tired or on Bennett Hill. I've seen kids obey their parents, and I've seen kids completely disrespect their parents. I've seen parents be kind to their children. I've seen parents completely disrespect their children. You say, well, that doesn't matter. I'm the parent. I can disrespect them if I want to. Stick around for a few weeks. Stick around for a few weeks. I've made the good phone calls, and I've made the dreaded phone calls. I've seen kids bring tears of joy to parents' eyes and tears of sorrow and sadness to children's eyes. And I've seen parents bring tears of joy to their children's eyes and tears of sadness to their child's eyes as well. Incredibly awkward, hard, heart-wrenching situations. I've seen parents uplift their kids. I've watched them completely destroy emotionally their relationship with their kids. I've heard things that no parent should say to a child and no child should say to a parent. But tonight we're not talking to children. Kids, you're off for a few minutes. I'm talking to parents tonight. The Bible gives us three passages in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, top of your page there, where the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. That means there's a way they should go and a way they shouldn't go. Right? You see, that, you see how there's the, both in that, in that word, in that context, there's both right there. Way to go, way not to go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. A lot of controversy about this verse right here. Controversy about, well, does this mean that if, if I do everything right, that a child will never make a wrong decision? Or does it more imply that if I do everything I'm supposed to do, that they will never escape from the truth of God's word, not depart from it? Say, Pastor, where are you at on it? I'm not exactly sure. I understand as a parent, I have a tremendous responsibility a God-commanded, biblically-challenged responsibility that does not let me off the hook. At the same time, I understand that every person gives a personal accountability of themselves before God. And that when my children are older, they cannot say to God, well, I didn't obey you because of my mom or my dad. We will all stand without excuse before God. So I don't know if it means that they'll never make a wrong decision 
I think it does involve the fact that they want to escape from the truth and that my responsibility is great. The responsibility better rest heavily on my shoulders. I see Ephesians 6, verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I can't help but read this verse and think of a situation years and years ago. I was here at the church, of course, and watching a parent berate their child. About this far in their face and just going at them, going at them. Just cause I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Saying things that a, that a parent should, I don't think, ever say to their child. Harassing, berating, demeaning. And after about five to six minutes, the child snapped. I'm not excusing the snapping of the child. I remember kind of observing that. I was at the other side of the room watching this. And I remember thinking, so that's Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That child should not have responded that way. But quite frankly, they were pushed over the edge. Their responsibility to react the right way. But boy, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3 and 4. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Now, some of you men are bow hunters. Some of you ladies are bow hunters. I am not. I have a crossbow, and I have a left-handed bow. I'm left-eye dominant. Can I shoot the left-handed bow? Barely. Barely. You know the old William Tell story? Right? Shooting the apple? Johnny, James, everybody be dead. Everybody be dead. Well, actually, probably not, because it'd be about 30 feet to the left, 30 feet to the right. They'd be safe. They'd be safe. I'm sure glad that shooting a real bow is not a prerequisite for training children, but I, but I see the correlation right there. The careful skill that it takes. I've shot a bow just enough to know that I'm not good at it. And just enough to know that it takes a good bit of skill and practice. And along the way, you may make some mistakes. But a skillful bow hunter doesn't snap the bow and say, that's it, I'm done. He gets back and hits it again. Keeps on working. We have a responsibility from the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time and I pray you'd help us. Lord, direct our minds towards you around these passages of Scripture. Would you give us your direction, your wisdom, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 2019, almost 60% of young people, by the time they reached the 12th grade, had tried alcohol. In 2019, when this survey was done, 30% had drank in the last month. In 2018, 728,280 children were arrested in the U.S., arrested almost three quarters of a million arrested or basically a child or teen was arrested every 43 seconds that's unbelievable to me that's unfathomable to me that every minute a child or teen was arrested not stopped arrested in that time, they gave me the numbers about how many were held in a residential placement and how many were placed in restrictive facilities. And how many children were incarcerated in adult prisons. And in 2017, on any given night, almost 1,000 children, 935 children, were incarcerated in adult prisons every single night. We'd like to thank that in a church, it's a little bit better. And I would submit that it probably is. I would hope and pray and think that we don't have a child here arrested every 43 seconds. Be a little awkward. Try to raise you up for quite a few of them in a row there. We'll just line them up and get them out the door. But having been here for now 19 years, there's a truth that we're not always doing a great job, parents. We're not always nailing it. I want to bring some truth, and so I've entitled this series, Top 10 Ways to Ruin Your Children. You say, well, Pastor, how did you get these 10 ways? Easy. I just looked at what I did today, 
All right, he took the 10 worst ones and wrote them down for us. All right, listen, we make mistakes every day. Understand a couple things. Uh, three things I want you to understand before we start this series. Number one, as parents, we're all going to make mistakes. If being a perfect parent is a criteria for having perfect children, then we are all sunk. I would submit that the perfect father still had disobedient children. His name was God, the first children, Adam and Eve. Does not excuse us, though. No excuse. Well, I did my best. I guess I didn't choose the Lord. Should grieve us. Hopefully we can learn something, but we're going to make mistakes. We must realize, number two, that we have certain tendencies, attitudes, and actions to correct. If we approach this thing, parenting, just based on what we know, we will make a mess of it. One of my most often prayers that I pray for myself is, Lord, help me not to mess up my children. Because if I do it like I think I know how to, there are many times I think I'm a pretty smart guy, and I'm not. And if I think I know how to raise my kids, I'm going to make a royal mess out of this thing called parenting. And if you think you're going to be okay just by winging it, my friend, you are mistaken. You are mistaken. We have all have tendencies, attitudes, and actions that have no place in our parenting style. Well, that's just the way I was raised. Well, maybe you were raised wrong. Well, that's just the way I am. Well, good. Now you've identified your deceitful, sinful, wicked heart. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ who seeks to change you. We all have these things, attitudes, actions, and tendencies that are wrong. And number three, this initial thing to think about, that God brings truth and help to our parenting. He'll bring things that we don't like to hear. I am so thankful for a godly wife. In college, they, they, they told us, you know, if you find a wife, you've obtained favor with the Lord, and he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Praise the Lord. I don't think, they probably said it, but I don't think they uh, gave enough emphasis to a godly wife, especially in regards to home and to children. I was so thankful for Doreen because she could undermine my kids every step of the way. And she helps me. She helps me. She helps me when I'm off on a tangent, and I need to come off that tangent. I've told this maybe one time here, but it was a few months back now on a Saturday night. I was cranking on the kids, as a good dad needs to do. All right? They weren't in bed. All right? The teeth weren't brushed. It's Saturday night. we got church tomorrow. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. You do this, you do this. I mean, i got a great plan. All orderly. All right? One, two, three. I'm delegating. I'm sending boom, boom, boom. Kids, all right. And you have 33 seconds. Go. All right, this is, listen, I'm the man in my house. This is the way it is, right? Okay. Kids walk upstairs. She goes, honey? Yes, dear? Just sitting there, look at my phone. I think you're a little too hard on the kids tonight. Come, come, I'm not too hard on the kids. You can, thankfully, I'm here to make sure, all right, that we're on track in this household. No, that's what I'm, you know, that's how we act, right? She was right. I said, honey, you're right. Now, I don't like admitting that because my flesh doesn't like to be wrong. My pride doesn't like that. But she was right. Kids, they down a few minutes later, 33 seconds actually, 30 seconds later they came down. <laughs> Teeth brushed, hair combed, the Bible translated to uh, 15 foreign languages. <laughs> That's right. For the dad in the house. <laughs> I said, kids, I said, I'm sorry. I said, mom pointed out to me that I was cranking on too much and she was right. Right, you, you're doing great, kids, and... I love you, and I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You know, like kids, like they do. Oh, yeah, Dad, we love you. And um, I'm thankful for a good wife who will look at me and say, Honey, hold on. We need that. I need that. I, me for her and she for me. What the Bible teaches is different than psychology and cultural ph philosophy. It'll teach you things like, listen, um, you, your kids will not handle good, strict discipline. You will ruin them. The Bible teaches the opposite. Philosophy, psychology teaches, well, don't ever tell someone they're wrong because they're not. All right, they just weren't exactly right. So two plus two equaling five, good job. That's great. You did it. But next time, we're going to say it's four, all right? But, but don't feel bad, because you're not wrong. 
And I don't want to hurt your psyche. I don't want to hurt your self-esteem. I don't want you to be depressed that you got it wrong because you didn't get it wrong. You were so close. You were closer than six. Isn't that great? No, two plus two does not equal five. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. It's four. I don't hate you because of it. Life's not over because of it, but you were wrong. All right, and sticking that knife into the electrical socket is wrong. It will not be good. Oh, good idea. Look at you being so creative. No, I don't want you blowing circuits in my house. I don't need you as a child to die. All right, so no, this is not good. You can't do that. Oh, I like that expression, how you slapped your sister. Look at that. Now, we can't be mean to other people. No, you don't hit your sister. You're wrong. The Bible teaches love and compassion and a tenderness. So let me tonight give you just two ways to ruin your kids. The first one tonight to lead off this whole series. If you want to ruin your kids, number one, if you want to ruin your kids, then just raise moral character-driven, nice kids. If you want to ruin your kids, then just raise moral, character-driven, nice kids. You know, I just want a good kid. I just want a kid who is where they're supposed to be and, and smiling. I want a kid who doesn't complain. Character. I want a kid who pays their bills and works hard. Now, I want my kids to have character. I want my children to be kind. I want them to be honest in their dealings. I want my kids to say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. So do I. But that is not the end goal in my raising of my children. Each of these will have what's called the deceptive thought. Here's a deceptive thought inside of this. My kids don't cause me problems. That equals I'm doing a good job. My kids don't cause me problems. That means I'm doing a good job. No, that doesn't equal that. That equals that maybe you haven't caught them yet. And it was that maybe you're a disconnected dad. Them not causing you problems means precious little in life. Well, my kids aren't in trouble at school. Everything is A-OK. -okay. No, I'm a successful parent. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We are good actors and actresses, are we not? Sometimes kids don't have problems at school because they don't want the conflict in their life. Their outward actions are following the, the, the system and the rules and the controls in place, but their insides are way, way, way far away. They put a smile on their face, but on the inside, they're so far away, like the young child who didn't want to sit down. The teacher said, Johnny, sit down. And as he sat down, he muttered, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. You see, just because there's no trouble at school does not mean you're successful, everything's okay. Sometimes, dads, um, you just let the moms handle that. And that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Let me just pause here real quick, a little plug in here. At school, parents, kids, all right, it is mom and dad. It may be that one person maybe sometimes take the lead, but we're in this together. We're in this together, right? It's not just mom's job. It's not just dad's job. We're in this together. There are two of you for this child and two of you to raise this thing. All right, so dads, don't just pass it off to mom. Well, I don't handle that stuff. That's, no, no, that's mom's job. No, 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 we work together through this thing. Number three, my kids are ready to work hard be diligent and have some good character qualities. I've nailed it. I've nailed it. L look at that kid. They got a scholarship to college. Look at that kid. You know when they walk into their place of business, boy, they think they're the best worker there. And look how respectful everyone at church says, boy, they're just so respectful. We are not called, we are not called to just raise good kids. We are not called to just raise good kids. We are not called to just raise honest kids. We are not called to just raise dependable kids. We are not called to just raise kids full of good characteristics. We are called, under the correct response, we are called to raise children to follow God. And if you want to ruin your children, 
The quickest and easiest way is to just focus on them being good, character, problem-free. Hey, sit up. Sit up. That's what we do. I know most of you sat up like that. Look at that. You've had that before. <laughs> that was pretty good over there. I saw that. I saw that, Miss Jackie. I saw that. Yeah. Right? It happens, right? Hey, hey, stop that. Quit that. Now, I am not opposed to these things. Understand. I think kids ought to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. Kids ought to be hard workers. They ought to help out around the house. They ought to help out around the house. All right, Mom, uh, you don't have to make the bed for your kids. They can make their own bed. Well, he's two months old. About time he started picking up after himself. No, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. When can they make their own bed? By the time they start sleeping in one by themselves, they can probably make their own bed. Right, somewhere in there. I think my kid's about two years old and moved to the, the big boy, big girl bed. They can start learning how to make that thing. What a shock to know that over the years, I know that some moms make their children's bed when they're in high school. High school. You're not helping them. You're not helping them. If they have a problem, it does not help when you try to deal with it for them. They have a job interview and they're 18, don't call for them. This has happened. We know this, all right? And pretend you're the child. It's happened. You know. You're like, no, Pastor, you're making that up. I'm dying if I'm lying. All right, the point is not just to have good kids. The point is to have godly kids, kids that will follow Jesus Christ. If they follow Jesus Christ, you know what they'll be? They'll be good kids. If they follow Jesus Christ, you know what they'll have? They'll have some character. If they follow Jesus Christ, they'll respect adult and authority. Why? Because they're following Jesus Christ, and those things are found to be biblical. But that is not the end all. That is not the goal, that your kids don't embarrass you at church. Your kids will embarrass you at church. My kids embarrass me at church sometimes. And I've seen parents react to the embarrassment. Don't do that. Howells, don't do that. No, no, no. All right. Child of God, we embarrass the Lord. The big fault is not embarrassing me and mom. But parents get bent on shape when, when you're embarrassed. No, no, don't just focus on that. Focus on raising godly children. Correct response, we are called to raise children to follow God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. These instructions were given specifically to the children of Israel. To make sure that the children of Israel, their children, did not forget what God had done. And that command in this passage goes beyond the children of Israel. It applies to you and I as parents. That we are to train our children, teach them, the Bible says, in the way. Let me give you some thoughts about what that looks like. The first way is this. We're desiring to impart spiritual truths. You want your children to follow God? Then you desire to impart spiritual truths. You try to teach them some spiritual things, some spiritual truths. How often do you talk about the Bible with your children? Well, I sent them to a Christian school. Well, la di da I bring them to church three times a week. Good. You ought to. But how often do you, Dad, how often do you, Dad, talk about the Bible with your child, with your children? Like, hey, here's a Bible verse. Think about this. Hey, here's when you said that to your mom, you weren't following this Bible verse. Hey, this is what I read in my devotions. This was really cool. This made Daddy laugh today. Boy, you know what? When I heard that sermon the other day, kiddos, boy, that just touched my heart. How often do you talk about the Bible, a desire to impart spiritual truths? This year, I've shared with you that my family and I, this year, we're reading through the Bible together, the chronological Bible. 
In our family devotions, each night besides Sunday and Wednesday, we pray together, but every other night we share what we read and everyone brings some different truth. Now, this is not, I'm not saying that you have to do this. This is what we do. All right, this is what we do. We share biblical truths. And I love hearing what the kids bring. Now, some of your children are going to be too young for that right now. All right, so teach them something from the Bible. Teach them some, some truths about, about how to love God, about what God can do. But how often do you talk about the Bible with your kids? Here's another question, dads and moms. When was the last time a verse came out of your mouth? A verse. Not one of your own versions of verses that you kind of mush 15 verses together. And God said, thou shalt be kind to each other. Or thus saith the Lord, thou shalt reap the destruction of a thousand Canaans or something like that, right? We do that. But a Bible verse came out of your mouth. And not just in a disciplined manner. You obey. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. You be kind. Be ye kind. Now, we ought to apply the Bible to life, but when was the last time a verse came out of your mouth to your kids? You just shared a verse. You see, we're real good about showing up in church. We're real good. You're here on a Wednesday night, real good about dropping them off at school. They're learning Bible class. Real good about making sure they memorize those Bible verses. When was the last time a verse came out of your mouth to your children? When was the last time you prayed with your kids and not just for the meal? Not just for food. You're prayed with them. I have the privilege of driving my kids to school every morning. My wife's heading off to teach in Saginaw Township. Well, not now. She's on rehab. But when she goes back, I get to drive the kids to school. And many mornings, not every morning, but most mornings, I'll ask kids, hey, kids, what are we praying for today? They'll pray. They'll mention their prayer requests. I love hearing what they're praying for. Dad, pray that at recess I'll have a good attitude. Absolutely. Recess is a tough place, right? Come on now, after recess. Man, picked last. Oh, that was me, you know? Okay, we'll take the girls. You take Howell. Oh, man. <laughs> They'll say, Dad, help me, to, help me to be quiet in class today. Not to talk out when I'm not supposed to. Okay, all right, let's talk about that. Help me to be kind, Dad. I need to be kind to so-and-so in my class. Okay, we'll pray about that. Desiring to impart spiritual truths. Number two there, teaching in the way deterring actions, attitudes, and attentions that hinder a walk with God. Or let me say it this way. Be a parent. Be a parent. It's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. All right, you're the parent. God gave you these children. So guide them. Actions, attitudes, Things that will hinder, and attentions that hinder a walk with God, a relationship with God. I want to deter these things. Hey, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to allow that in this house. As for this house, we will serve the Lord. So we're going we're gonna to stop that. Every house can look a little bit different. That's okay. That's okay. It's the beauty of the individual priesthood of the believer and soul liberty. All right, we get, to, we get to walk that path. There's some things that I do at my house that you may not do at your house. There's something that you may do at your house, I don't do at my house. But I'm trying to have a household that makes it easy for my children to walk with God. And that's one reason why I mute the commercials. Because I realize that that music, for our house, is not helpful. Now, some of you ought to mute your phones. And your MP3 players, and your Alexas, and everything else, we mute the TV. One time, at a, uh, at a parent school years ago, so I'm having trouble with my child and their cell phone. What should I do, Pastor Howell, Pastor J.D. at that time? I said, well, you know, being a naive young principal, I said, well, you can take the, you can take the cell phone away from them. They looked at me with utter shock. I wish I could duplicate the face that I had that day. I was shocked. They were shocked. Oh, no. I could never do that. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. You take it. You say, this is now mine. 
Well, what, what will they do? I don't care. <laughs> I'm paying for it. That's your fault, not mine. Young people, you're not going to be happy at me, okay? So just plug your ears for a second. And you should stop now. Parents, I'm going to tell you something just honest and as frank as I can be. Your kids do not need a cell phone, a smartphone. They say, well, they're driving. I want to contact them. Excellent. Get them a flip phone that has 50 minutes on it. If they get an accident, they can call you. At the end of the month, it better have 50 minutes on there. They don't need a cell phone. They don't need one. You can turn off. Well, they're paying for it themselves. I don't care. My kids live in my house. If I don't want them to have a cell phone, then they're not going to have one. You know? And if they, see, if they find one, then I'm going to confiscate the cell phone. They don't need one. I dealt so many times with issues on cell phones and young men and young ladies. And the pressure is there because, you know what? So-and-so just got one. And so-and-so got one. And wow, and they just got an iPhone. And they got an iPhone. Listen, I've been through cell phones. I move through them like they're free. They're not, but I move them like they're free. Okay? Um, for a while, my brother-in-law was selling cell phones, and so I just keep on upgrading. All right? I've, I've had the latest technology. End of the day, cell phone is great for this, making receiving phone calls. Is it handy for other things? Sure, sometimes. But kids don't need them. They don't need them. You are giving your child a viper, a poisonous snake. See, already when they're young, they understand what I'm saying. They know what I'm saying. <laughs> and you say, well, I'm going to really monitor my kid's cell phone. You're not smart enough. You are not smart enough. Very, very few people. Um, I'm pretty good at technology. I've done a lot of things. Monitor, I had to monitor for the school. And I don't want my kids to have a cell phone. Right now, I don't speak that out of biblical revelation, okay? So don't think I get out of here and be like, the Bible says don't have a cell phone. I'm giving you my personal opinion. I'm trying to help, be help here. But you can deter. And these things, these cell phones at a young age, detract. They distance. They create problems that the children shouldn't have to face yet when they're 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. I'm sorry, young people, because I know you love the cell phones. They're communicating all night long sometimes. You say, well, I know everything they say. No, you don't. No, you don't. I'll give you a list of apps you probably don't know about. Well, my kids probably don't know about them either. Okay. Okay. And that's why you ask them to help you on your phone when you can't figure it out. <laughs> they don't need them. They don't need them. You say, oh no, well, I've already got it, what do I do? <laughs> Cancel it. They'll be so mad at me. And then we have to decide as a parent, will I sacrifice my child's walk with God if I truly believe that, will I sacrifice my child's walk with God for what I perceive their attitude toward me is like? And parents, we're guilty sometimes of not being parents because we're just chicken. That's why the mom and dad at Walmart buy the candy bar because they're nothing but a coward, nothing but a chicken. And that's why Christian parents aren't parents sometimes. Because you're nothing but a coward. I could probably say it nicer. I'm sorry. Let me give you one more here. We'll wrap up here. If you want to train in the way, have a correct response, you want to desire to depart spiritual truths, deter actions, attitudes, intentions to hinder a walk with God. And number three, to display a humble and authentic relationship with God. You want to have your kids follow God, then make sure you model a humble and authentic relationship with God. That means your kids ought to see you read your Bible and spend time with God. They ought to know you do that. Right now, because you sit out there and say, okay, kids, uh, daddy's reading his Bible now. Well, because they come upon you and you're reading your Bible. 
when you're praying, they find out that you're praying for them. They ought to see you respond to God. Don't expect your kids to go forward at an invitation if you never have. Don't expect your kids to sing at church if you don't sing. Don't expect your kids to be excited at church and worship at church if you aren't excited to be at church and worship at church. I desire to raise kids who have a sincere heart to listen and follow God. And I'm not here, again, to stand in a critical, cynical judgment. I'm here as a pastor, as a friend, as a fellow parent to say, listen, I don't want to ruin my kids, but I want my kids to follow God. I'm going to make plenty of mistakes. I make them all the time, all the time. And I pray by God's grace that those mistakes will be forgiven and that they will not be what the kids remember. But I know what I desire, and I desire my kids to walk with God. And with God's grace, I'm do everything I'm supposed to that I can think of to help them do that. I'm going to bring them to church. I'm going to pray with them. I'm going to bring them in family devotions. And I want them to be good. I want to be nice, respectful. But that's not my end goal. I want them to love God. All right, well, I did not finish this one. We'll come back. We'll finish it, and I will not spend as much time in introduction next time. Appreciate you being here. Along the way, we will get that number starting next week back up. If you have questions along the way, we will take those questions and maybe even have a time when we can answer those. Um, not that I'm an expert, but I want to help our church grow as godly parents. Now, listen, I love our children here. I think you know that. And if I'm talking to you and a child comes up, sorry, have a nice day, child. I'm going to talk to the child, all right? I love our children and overall, I'm encouraged, all right? Don't, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, we've just, we, we've out of it. But if you think this applies to you, all right, it's probably the Holy Spirit, and it probably does. As I was writing these lessons, as I'm writing them, I'm like, oh boy, i got to fix that. But that's good. I want God to always deal with me. All right, and Lord willing, will give us some strong, strong family.